I'll look at a Calvin and whether or not Calvinism is correct and it's limited atonement. Christ only died for those who are going to be saved. John 3, 14 to 20. Just as Moses lift up, lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world. See, this is a world elect. To condemn the world. Only some are condemned, not all. All are condemned. But to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. So whoever the elect, well, the elect will all believe. So you don't have to say this. So obviously, whoever of the world, not just the world of the elect, believes in him is not condemned. But whoever of the world does not believe, see, some of the elect, well, the elect all believe. So whoever does not believe, that's not, so it must be the whole world, not just the elect or the world of the elect. But whoever of the whole world does not believe, stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Obviously the whole world is in view here. So the world here in this passage must mean the whole world, elect and not elect. Just look at the verses. Just as Moses lifted, lifted up the snake in the desert, so the man, son of man must be lifted up that everyone, not everyone of the elect, because everyone of the elect will believe, but everyone who believes, everyone of the elect will believe. It must be everyone of the world who believes in him. Those limited few who believe of the world may have eternal life. So our Lord continues to provide Nicodemus with a picture of himself as the Son of Man using an Old Testament earthly reference about Moses lifting up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert so that everyone who was bitten by a deadly poison snake could simply look upon it and be healed of the deadly venom. The picture of believing that a look upon Moses' snake, bronze snake, lifted up in the desert, he took a bronze snake and attached it to a pole and put it by his tent, and his tent was usually in the middle of the whole congregation of Israel. That's a big old gathering. And they just looked at, see their bronze snake sticking up in the air and they wouldn't die of the snake bite. So Moses' Moses's bronze snake lifted up in the desert to provide physical life salvation is thus compared to believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man himself, being lifted up in some manner to provide eternal life. And we find out the matter was on the cross. Verse 14 portrays all of those who were bitten by poisonous snakes, not just the chosen few. So provision was made for all of them to be saved and from physical death through the bronze snake on the pole. The ones that were bitten, all of them, they just had a look at the pole. That's just a moment of believing and looking. And all, or any of them, all any of them uh, had to do was to look at it. In the same way, verses. 15 is parallel to the bronze snake miracle. Just as, da, 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 so, so it portrays everyone in the world, and not just the chosen few, to have a provision made for them through the Son of Man to be saved unto eternal life. All any individual in the whole world had to do was to believe in him, making this provision, and he would be saved forever unto eternal life. So on the snake, the bronze snake, he got bitten by the snake, you look there, and your physical life wouldn't end. It would be ongoing and live out the length of your years. You didn't look, you died of the snake point. So it would behoove you, those who were bitten by the snake, that's a whole population of you here, to look at the snake on the bronze pole. The manner of being lifted up will be corroborated later as our Lord was going to the cross at Calvary to die for the sins of the whole world. This picture is continued in the next verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his... He gave to the world his one and only Son. How did he give to the world? Well, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a priest, who performed animal sacrifices in view is sacrifice for sins, payment for sins, instead of the individual having to pay for his sins. The animal was sacrificed. So, so his one and only Son was given 
for your sins. I.e., his son died to pay the penalty for sins for the whole world. For at the beginning of verse 16 continues the thought from 14 and 15, which has every one of the whole view, world in view, not just the chosen few, the, verse 16. And everyone who was bitten by a snake is in view in 14, and, and, and then 15 begins with uh, the Christ dying for your sins, and 16 finishes it. So after 4 comes for God so loved the world, which provides the motivation for God's provision of eternal life for everyone in the world, not just the chosen few. That's his love. Then we have the phrase that he gave his one and only son, monogene, one and only, not uh, uh, the only begotten. Monogene means one and only, unique one, which parallels verse 15, the Son of Man must be lifted up, both picturing the Son of Man, the Son of God, being lifted up, given to pay the penalty for the sins of, the, of every individual in the whole world. The phrase, God gave his one only son, is in the historical present ta past tense, meaning that our Lord was speaking to Nicodemus before he was crucified as if Calvary had already taken place. Note that verse, that's a common thing, you can do that in English as well. It's a done deal. Want me to take care of your cabin while you're away? So I'll, I'll fix it up, keep it secure, mow the lawn. It's done. has not done it yet. Historical past or present. Oh, no, past, historical past tense. Note that verse 15 corroborates this by portraying this same event as future. You know, a lot of things with Greek that you can do with English. The term the Son of God is a technical term, as established in other passages in Scripture, for one who has the attributes of God. Hence, God the Son was given once for all time, completed action verb, for the sins of the whole world by God the Father. Following this, is the phrase that, that whoever believes in him, literally whoever is the believing one, whoever is a believer in the Son of God being given for one's sins, which takes only a moment of time of faith. So God so loved the world, whoever, the world whoever, cannot be limited to a few chosen individuals, for it would be tantamount to saying that God so loved the world of only a chosen few who will believe, not the rest, and that whoever of this chosen group would believe should have eternal life. Well, this is nonsensical, since all of God's chosen will believe anyway. Right? So why make this distinction at all? In truth, how, whoever refers to the whole world's population, because it's not limited in the passage there, just says the whole world. God so loved the world, wherein everyone has a chance and a free choice to not believe in the Son and stay condemned or believe and receive eternal life. Finally, the phrase should not perish, but should have everlasting life has in view the immediate, sure result of never perishing in hell. The word should here is objective possibility. So you believe, then you should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Well, what's the problem? The problem is, is God reliable? Well, of course he is. So it's a done deal. Got it? Some people say, well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Yeah, but the one giving it to you, how reliable is he? And we're done. So we have in, mu in view the immediate sure result of never perishing in hell, completed action verb, an immediate, immediate present tense possession. Oops. This thing does crazy things. Immediate present tense possession of everlasting life, and it's forever because it is everlasting by definition. So if you say, well, yeah, but you could mess up and then God will take it away. Well, then it wasn't everlasting life. Took it away in 10 minutes, 10 years, 10, then it's 10 minute life, not everlasting. You can't say it's everlasting life. One guy tried to tell me, yeah, you have everlasting life, but if you go to hell, the life is, is not there for you to get, but it's still everlasting. What? People make up the most nonsensical things. You can't read that way because nobody in their normal mindset, to learn how to read would take it that way. It's normative rules of language, context, and logic for the average person of a cannibal age. From the first moment of becoming the believing one and the Son of God being given for one, one is eternally secure in everlasting life. 
So the word should has in view the capacity and willingness of God to provide eternal life, which considering his sovereignty and power is emphatically a sure thing the moment one believes in the Son of God. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 4 continues the context of verses 14 to 15, which has in view everyone in the whole world who will ever live. It is not limited to a chosen few. So, I'll say, furthermore, if God sent his son up here into the world to provide for the salvation of only a chosen few, then he would also would have been sent to condemn the rest of the world without such provision or not so chosen. But this contradicts the clear passage of verse 17, for there is no condemnation of you here at all. But listen. Look at verse 17. Verse 18 he continues to say that God's purpose for sending his son into the world was not to condemn the world, but to save it through his son. The world, not the world of the elect. He's not there to condemn uh, the world and give advantage only to those who are chosen few. He's ready to give everybody eternal life. So, world and whoever, those two words, in John 3, 14 to 20, cannot be limited to just the elect. God so loved the world, whoever. The world, whoever, the word whoever, cannot be limited to the elect, but would have be tantamount the saying that God so loved the world of the elect that whoever of the elect would believe and will have eternal life. This would not make sense because God is infallibly determined that all of those who are elect will believe, but of their own volition. Remember that. Since all of the elect will believe, then, to say whoever the elect will believe is misleading and erroneous. And we go to verse 18. We can jump there. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Remember, you and I, before we believed, we stood condemned. Then we believed. Thank God for his grace and my free will. Continuing the context established in verse 17 and early in 16, the word whoever must be a universal whoever, elect and non-elect. If it were limited to the elect, the verse would sound redundant and contradictory. Let's see how it would sound. Whoever the elect believes in him is not condemned. All the elect will believe, so why say this? But whoever the elect who does not believe stands condemned already. This is contradicting to say since none of the elect will choose not to believe. All right. Yeah, in this passage also, Lewis Perry Chaffer says, the Greek word cosmos is used to refer to the organized world. Now, to limit the word world in the verse 16 to the elect is to contradict what the passage says. It is obvious from four, verse 17 that God did not send his son to the elect, but to the entire world. Verse 19 declares that the light is coming to the world. It's the world of the elect. And that this light is rejected by people who love darkness. So the world world here is clearly refers to the entire creation, including the non-elect. In the light of the context, an important element in exegesis, the word world in verse 16 must be universal. Now the word whosoever or whoever is used about 110 times in the New Testament with the obvious inference that it is universal in its application. In regard to the death of Christ as providing salvation, the word whosoever is used in John 3.16 in the statement, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Whosoever, everyone. A similar statement is made in Acts 10.43. All the prophets testify about him that everyone of the whole world who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word panta, everyone. So even in the final invitation to the unsaved to come to Christ, Revelation 22.17 it states, the spirit and the bride come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. So whoever, the one who, him, all these passages have the word in view, world in view, that, that state that Christ died for the elect and not decisive in themselves, but even one statement of scripture that Christ died for all should be sufficient to support the doctrine of unlimited atonement. 